Um, so without any further ado, let me introduce today's guest, our keynote speaker. Professor Matthias Yarka is the 2020 ER uh, Peter P. Chen Award recipient. Uh, Peter Chen, of course, is the founder of this, of this field and this conference. Um, and uh, Professor Yarka is very well known. Um, he, he has been a professor of databases and information systems at RWTH Aachen University for the better part of three decades. Uh, he's also a director of the Fraunhofer FIT Institute for Applied Information Technology. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Hamburg, and he's been very active in the field of conceptual modeling and databases. Um, he's, he's a man who doesn't need much introduction. He's, he's very well known for his fine work. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn the time over to Professor Yarka, who will speak to us on conceptual modeling foundations for alliance-driven data ecosystems. Professor Yarka, welcome to ER 2020. Thank you for your contributions to the conference and to the field, and we look forward to hearing your keynote speech now. Thanks a lot, Steve, and of course, thanks a lot once again for the award. Okay, and start my presentation. So it's almost, uh, sorry for the young guys, uh, it's almost exactly 40 years and 40 days ago that I defended my dissertation at the University of Hamburg. And uh, I started around 77 and I uh, uh, chose the then very novel subject of trying to make a decision support system uh, for the container transportation system. I took a lot of interviews and visited places like this uh, port of Hamburg. And I spent a lot of time there. This is a recent photo. Uh, and I, then I uh, tried to make this uh, integrated data model. And I noticed that uh, doing this in the relational way, which I had learned during my studies was quite new then, uh, was not going to work at all. So I looked for more abstract modeling formalisms. The first one I found, which was uh, invented in the late 60s uh, by Adam Petri, are these Petri nets by which I could nicely represent the process of storage uh, loading uh, of uh, the ships uh, to trucks, to trains, and so on and so forth, as shown on the left-hand side. And I also, uh, but then I also needed something for the data modeling itself. And there I found a journal article which had just appeared a few months ago in the first issue of uh, ACM transactions on database system by the guy in the upper right, to whom I will be ever grateful for getting me started in the, into the conceptual modeling field uh, so directly. Of course, I was a little bit over ambitious and I tried to make uh, immediately an extension to the entity relationship model as it was published by aspects of time and of activities and so on, which uh, uh, I think in the long run was not necessarily a good idea because the simplicity of the ER model is of course the strongest point, but this is like the summary data model uh, that I came up with. So uh, thanks to Peter and especially happy to get this award. Uh, a core observation from this already was that uh, views are an essential concept for any complex uh, data system and uh, the formal and automated handling would save us a lot of uh, work uh, when uh, making complex data ecosystems like this container transportation system. I should say that part of the technical support uh, using black blockchains for supporting this battery net process are just being adopted in practice now, which is uh, 30 years later, essentially. Uh, so uh, views in general, as you all know, 
are on the one hand models, which are used for example, in requirements engineering and IT security uh, can be used for modeling different viewpoints on requirements, access rights uh, for user groups uh, and uh, controlled data exchange as we will discuss later. But they are also partially materialized data abstractions. So they can be materialized by pre-computing, uh, for example, to speed up query processing, uh, by trying to answer queries only using a collection of views rather than to have large uh, access to large amount of base data, which may be secret. Uh, even to update such uh, externally materialized uh, views uh, and uh, also for observing what is happening. So here we need, so to speak, a mapping uh, down from the models to the data themselves, such a model-driven design situation. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, three steps of these data ecosystems that uh, we have worked on over the years and some things that uh, will be a challenge for the future towards the end. Uh, in the first step, uh, we'll look from uh, the viewpoint of data warehouses to data lakes. So the more technical uh, perspective of how kind of views can be used for optimization. Uh, second aspect then will be a community perspective. Uh, this was already alluded to uh, by Eric Yu in his talk yesterday. Uh, that we need uh, social aspects and end user involvement in many data ecosystems nowadays. And finally, I look at the same aspect uh, from the viewpoint of cooperation between organizations that don't fully trust each other. And I will talk about uh, the uh, so-called International Data Spaces Initiative that we have started about six years ago, and also about the just beginning uh, Gaia X, huge effort of the European uh, community uh, to deal uh, with this uh, general question. Our starting point was a cooperation with uh, John Milopoulos and others. John has been mentioned as a common point uh, yesterday, also by Eric. And in fact, uh, when I spent a sabbatical in 1988 uh, at the University of Toronto, I had could uh, see uh, the early steps uh, in the first PhD year of Eric Yu. So we know each other since that time. Uh, and uh, but the main task there was to finalize a conceptual modeling language that we had been working on for many years and for which we in our group then had already uh, developed a special kind of implementation which was aimed at this idea of uh, viewpoint integration transfer transforming views in other views mapping for example from designs to uh, implementation code and so on. Uh, the views were formally linked via so-called meta formulas in the Telos language, which I will not uh, describe here again in detail, but you can find a review paper uh, on the history of this in the next uh, issue of the Requirements Engineering Journal. Uh, and what we did for concept base was especially to simplify the semantics of this uh, so that it could be translated into pure data log uh, with uh, stratified negotiate, uh, neg negation. Uh, so a logic programming language, a sim very simple one. And this way we could reuse all the ideas of deductive database optimization, such as partial evaluation and semantic optimization uh, to make efficient uh, optimization across several levels from the top down 
uh, away, all the way to the bottom. Uh, so what is called now multi-level deep modeling. This allowed queries, integrity checks, and also some model level viewpoint revolution, resolution, but not yet active data exchange, which needs something like tuple generation. Concept base as a system was widely used. I think we had overall about 20,000 users and is still maintained and evolved by Manfred Joisfeld, who has uh, done most of the implementation work in the early times. And then many other dissertations followed. From another perspective, we saw that we need some kind of way how to organize large amounts of these kinds of views. Uh, and already in the original Taylor's paper with John Milopoulos, we proposed a division in a four world uh, kind of uh, meta ontology where we describe as information system as combination of uh, four worlds. First of all, the system itself from a technical viewpoint. Uh, then the subject domain it is about. Uh, and then also the surroundings of the users, the guys who do the use cases, for example, with the system and are embedded in an organizational setting, which is visualized here in the picture on the left. Uh, by looking over the shoulder of the pure guy sitting on the machine, the actual end user. Uh, besides that, there is also a change activity, which we call the development world, uh, which continuously supports or is supposed to support changes in any of the other worlds and their relationships. So there could be changes in uses, there could be new regulations on uh, privacy, for example, that prevent us to do certain things in the subject world. Uh, and of course, there are constant changes in the te technology. We applied this in two major European basic research projects during the 1990s. And from that, a number of interesting abstractions arose. Uh, we had a fantastic team of PhD students uh, at the time, many of them like Klaus Pohl, Neil Maiden, uh, uh, Patrick Heimans, and uh, uh, George Svanudakis, also the chair of the last uh, case conference this summer. They uh, were all PhD students in this project. And so uh, one of the results of that, which is quite well known, is uh, three dimensions of requirements engineering, which somehow reflect what is going on in these different aspects of, of the three worlds. So in some sense, it shows the development view uh, on all the other aspects, like the specification, which is more the system's perspective. Uh, the representational issues, which is more the words, and uh, an agreement perspective, which looks at the social aspects. Uh, second point, which has also resided in reference models, which were adopted by many companies and international standards, is joint work with Bala Ramesh, uh, now from Georgia State University, one of the places where the election has not yet been decided, uh, and uh, where we uh, also synthesized many different views on traceability uh, that were established through uh, uh, focus groups with the leading software organization in the US. Uh, into a meta model uh, for traceability, which you can see here, plus a lot of elaboration. And finally, we try to link this to a work like the one from uh, Axel van Lamsuyade and uh, Eric Yu uh, to talk about uh, goals and requirements and link that uh, to the use case situation uh, then promoted by Jacobson and others 
in a goal and scenario integration environment. So these were activities at the level of requirements engineering. Uh, at the same time, we also looked more into the uh, data integration aspects of this, which is my uh, second part of my talk. Uh, and uh, we can see here what we did in the data warehouse area together with people like uh, Maurizio Lanzarini and uh, Timo Sellis uh, from Athens, uh, Janis Vasiliou, Eric Simon from Indria, and, and so on, um, where we tried to make a fresh look on what these databases are, uh, data warehouses were. On the right hand side, you can see the traditional view that was uh, relevant at that time, where you basically have a global as view kind of architecture, which uh, takes uh, information sources, somehow integrates them into a data warehouse with a lot of data cleaning and other activities. So with a lot of effort actually, and from then, from this data warehouse, which is considered something like a single source of truth, as the engineers like to say, uh, there were different views uh, in multidimensional data models, uh, or data models uh, called data marts. But if we look at a reality more from these different kinds of worlds, we can see that actually the information sources are not something uh, which is uh, falling from the sky, but they are observations, maybe histories of observations on what is actually going in an enterprise. And they may watch a lot of that or only a small part of that. So if we take this viewpoint, we can suddenly talk in terms of data quality about issues uh, such as uh, do we have all the necessary information sources for the kind of enterprise uh, that we want to support? And uh, so also for the analyst who probably would like to ask queries about the situation in the enterprise, he can or she can get some uh, background information. Uh, on how good the data are, how complete the data are, and so on, which is not really possible with a pure approach on the right. And for that, we need, of course, a different view, which is called this local as view approach, and indeed a combination of uh, both. So um, this has uh, stirred a lot of uh, research, and of course, uh, the ontological approach that was uh, presented in a fantastic keynote at uh, the case conference a couple of years ago in Rome by Maurizio Lanzarini is one possibility how to deal with this uh, modeling of the enterprise situation. Nevertheless, time has gone on and the original goal of the data warehouses was to separate uh, the a transactional system which was supposed to have very lots of changes and uh, so on from the query intensive uh, data warehouse system uh, where lots of data were locked with and there was this sort of an inherent concurrency control problem. However, over time, I think already in 2004, we were approached by the SAP company to say, well, this is really not uh, working anymore. We need our decision support much more on time, almost uh, synchronously with the data being created in the operational system. And so uh, a few years later, this idea of data lakes came up, which said, well, just load the data into, this, uh, into the database with an ingestion layer and store them in specialized storages to get a maximum of performance. Uh, even if this lake uh, is that we have there is something quite dirty and uh, we don't care 
because uh, the transformations will only happen, the necessary transformations that are usually happening in data warehouses already earlier, and the data cleaning, they will happen whenever the user wants something through his interaction layer. And therefore, we have uh, uh, in this way, uh, you get a pay as you go approach. So only when the customer wants an information, the customer has to pay, so to speak, the time efforts uh, for this activity. Uh, of course, uh, if you just throw dirt into such a lake, it will pollute very quickly. And uh, in our current work in this Internet of Production Excellence cluster at RWTH Aachen University, which is one of our main use cases for studies at the moment, uh, we do need uh, some uh, more on the fly uh, uh, optimization techniques. Uh, so we have here a milling example from our industrial use cases. Uh, and with a lot of sensors, of course, on different machines or different parts of the machines. Uh, so we will have multiple heterogeneous raw data inputs following many different kinds of data models or being just unstructured. Uh, and But then also, uh, of course, the data integration has to happen hopefully in parallel to the system peacefully sitting there. So you automatically try to learn schemas and to integrate the sources based on that or do a lot of work on the fly. And finally, of course, uh, when you have this cleaned up data lake, uh, the users should be able to ask uh, queries to that. I will now go a little bit into my uh, one, one first example uh, on technical work that has been recently done in the context of uh, my student uh, Rihan Hai, who has just finished a few months ago. Uh, so there were a number of bottlenecks in the existing literature identified besides this kind of architecture that you see here, which was uh, demonstrated at Sigma 2016 and was sort of the first formal architecture uh, for such data lakes. Uh, there was a need, uh, of course, for query rewriting in this uh, new, very heterogeneous setting on so-called poly stores, as you see them down there, Hadoop, Neo4j, graphics activities, and so on and so forth. Uh, automated metadata uh, enrichment uh, and this had to be based on sort of novel schema mapping generations for which telos was not uh, able anymore uh, also the uh, ontologies did not really help us so much uh, so we pursued this idea of tuple generating dependencies followed in the Clio project by Fagan and Rene Miller and others. Uh, so in, at the core are these schema mappings, which look a little bit like that. I don't want you to look too much at the formulas. This is a keynote talk, nothing in depth. Uh, so uh, when you go from hierarchical structures to other hierarchical structures, like almost everything except relational mappings, have that, then with the existing tools, you have to go through the relational uh, mapping. And this, of course, becomes very inefficient. So uh, here we invented something like nested uh, schema mappings, uh, where uh, during the whole process, the hierarchical structures of both the original object and the target mapping of the mapping would be uh, preserved and mapped to each other in this nested manner. If you look at that uh, from a performance viewpoint, uh, you can see that there are enormous uh, on, on re large real world sets with millions and millions of objects. 
we use some published data sets and some real data sets from our own settings. And uh, so you had uh, enormous gains uh, through this mapping approach. And this also transferred, uh, uh, this logic-based approach also transferred to the polystore situation. Here we have a use case where you have a query asked uh, to the central schema, which was somehow earned automatically by one of the other methods. And then it goes uh, with the SQL-like syntax uh, in a transformation into the logic uh, using these mapping algorithms. And then you can uh, ans uh, answer queries that in parallel have some, where some of the pieces are in relation databases and others in graph databases like Neo4j uh, or even XML translators, which are not database systems at all uh, and document-based uh, approaches. And again, there are enormous improvements in the speed of this so that we can do a little bit more uh, during the loading time and during the question answering time with these data lakes. A second aspect uh, that we have here, however, is uh, looking at the social perspective, which was yesterday's talk. I will just look at the development world here that, because we are also using to a large degree uh, certain aspects of the I-STAR modeling techniques here is a very nice formalism. And in our production engineering cluster, we are trying to bring together and have communication uh, between the production environment where products like cars or whatever are produced, uh, the end user environment, which is feedback from the uh, service stations running the customer data and so on and also from the engineering groups within the companies that are working maybe on the next uh, car and need feedback from, from the users and from the engineering side. Uh, for that, we based our ideas on, let's say, conceptual ideas on the so-called Atlas architecture that we had developed in our group in the late uh, 2000s. Uh, uh, for example, in a keynote I gave at the ER conference, in, in RE conference, not ER conference, <laughs> in, in 2002. Uh, and uh, we apply this uh, to understand better how these agile development methods, like the DevOps ecosystem, uh, process oriented ecosystem, with all these aspects for which thousands of tools exist. Some of them are shown in the background of the slide, but essentially they support uh, in integration of planning, the collaboration in the development itself, uh, in the hosting of code that you build, in the code integration, uh, in the deployment in the cloud, uh, and other real-time insights, and, and of course monitoring of everything. From a end user, or uh, there are some shortcomings uh, that we saw uh, in web development uh, systems uh, in this DevOps approach, because there are lots of issues which actually involve conflicts with uh, the world outside the system, so the user system. Uh, therefore, uh, an approach has been developed to integrate uh, the users through various aspects in these different phases, uh, making them aware of what is, or be making the users, uh, uh, the developers also aware uh, what is going in the usage practice, uh, getting ideas from the end users into the systems. Uh, for the co-design, uh, for the better testing, and uh, for context information about the development. Uh, if you look from this perspective, you find that there are actually lots and lots of uh, 
inputs and outputs uh, that you uh, have in this usage context which accompany uh, the lifetime of a system over long times. Uh, so of course uh, it, it makes a lot of sense uh, to link these users somehow into the DriveOps environment. And this is another dissertation that has been completed this year that we have uh, build a collection of tools and uh, which actually has shown that it is uh, flexibly enough over the last six years or so uh, to survive uh, three major changes in, in development. Okay, so we move from agile systems over this DevOps approach to community approach and now uh, few uh, remarks on the current uh, ongoing infrastructures, which is actually this idea of alliance-driven platforms. I have to point you here uh, to my keynote lecture at the case. I'm sorry for because uh, the time is short. I see already frowning from the side of the chairman. Uh, and uh, uh, to get into details of, of how this uh, works, but I want to point out a few important things here. Uh, so there are a number of these alliance-driven platforms where uh, people jointly develop such uh, cooperation or community platform as we uh, just saw. Uh, and this time it's not just people, it's organizations facing each other. Uh, we have therefore developed, let's say, a, a extensive requirements analysis and so on of this perspective uh, that is published in a in an electronics uh, market journal over uh, five years with uh, over 100 use case examples interviews focus groups and so on uh, and the result of that the technical result of that has been the idea of having uh, something like a uh, containers which are wrapping security secure wrapping organizations together with a large set of uh, rules and regulations which allow such communities of cooperating but not fully trusting each other techniques to work there's uh, uh, yeah there is something like an i star model or a general meta model. And actually, if you're interested in this, it's exactly parallel to ER going on the International Software uh, Semantic Web Conference, unfortunately. And somewhere there, you will also find a video which presents uh, this meta model in more detail. And I can do it here. The point is essentially that uh, the data consumers and the data providers have a lot of strategic dependencies on intermediate uh, services, uh, which they uh, basically can delegate these strategic dependencies a la RQ, uh, to other groups. Uh, the meta model itself that will be presented there is so, uh, to a large degree trying to reuse as many international standards as possible. They are listed here on these uh, slides and are organized in six different dimensions which reflect to a large degree, uh, again, the uh, four words that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so to summarize this part, this is almost my last slide. Uh, we can see that from these traditional use cases in the data integration and uh, in the modern form of the data lakes, we uh, can proceed by some additional technical and organizational measures uh, to secure data exchange. And if we really need hardcore consistency, then of course blockchain, uh, blockchain based things like the use in the container industry uh, are helpful. Last slide is more like an outlook. Uh, many of you may have heard uh, rumors about a European architecture for uh, yeah, a European architecture called Gaia X. Uh, 
which is at the moment mostly a French-German cooperation, but with many other European countries, about 500 people involved in discussion, even though there's not even funding for this. Uh, the key idea of the Gaia-X originally is uh, to have something like a distributed shared hyperscaler, like the ones that uh, Google or Amazon have available uh, under European control and in a decentralized fashion. Uh, and also uh, to have a collection of, uh, again, distributed decentralized services with certain guarantees. The results of this industrial database or international data space model are included in the aspects that are pointed here by the white uh, boxes and uh, in uh, several of those, especially the information model and uh, the app store and data app organization, my own group is also involved. But this is an activity which will is embedded in the core of uh, Mrs. von der Leyen's data strategy for Europe and will take us a lot and offer us a lot of your research opportunities in the next few years and I can invite the people here in the conference to contribute to that. Thank you very much.